They called her the Virgin Queen, England's first Queen Elizabeth. A legend in her own lifetime. Yet behind her fame lie many secrets and an unsolved mystery. Why didn't Queen Elizabeth marry and provide an heir to the throne? For centuries, rumors have swirled. Claims of illegitimacy, adultery, and even that the queen may not have been a woman at all, but a man, or somewhere in between. Now, the startling stories and secrets behind England's Virgin Queen. She's one of history's most storied leaders, and her 44-year reign became known as England's Golden Age. Yet for all her charisma and power, Queen Elizabeth I remained the Virgin Queen. She never married or produced an heir to the throne. The question is, why? It's the greatest mystery of her reign and fertile soil for speculation. It's the kind of court that might well generate rumors. Contemporaries must have thought, well, obviously Elizabeth ought to get married, so why isn't she getting married? The sleepy village of Bisley claims to have an answer. Located 85 miles outside of London, it hasn't changed much today. Bisley is home to Overcourt, a small hunting lodge of King Henry VIII's. One can still see the stone-walled garden where, according to legend, Little Lady Elizabeth once played with a boy her age. A boy now known as the Bisley Boy. As the story goes, when she is just 10 or 11, the young princess comes to live at Overcourt for a short period of time. While her father, King Henry is away. One day while playing, Elizabeth falls seriously ill. Her manservant and maidservant were absolutely terrified because there was a visit of the king coming very shortly to see his daughter. <coughs> In a matter of hours, she dies. They were extremely concerned that they might have their heads chopped off because he was rather prone to um, taking draconian action for people who displeased him. The desperate servants have a stroke of genius. They'll substitute a local child for the dead princess. One who resembles her in age, hair color, and complexion. The only problem? It's a boy. But the quick-witted servants dress him as Princess Elizabeth anyhow. According to legend, the Bisley boy was related to Henry VIII, which would have accounted for the resemblance. The story has been passed down in this village for over 400 years, and many of the locals still believe it could be true.
when you go back in history and you look at the way that she was described later on in her adult life, yeah, there does start to become some form of semblance of possibly the truth about it. And it is rumoured that this sickly child, having spent time in the country with her bad teeth through eating sweetmeats and her poor complexion, returned to the capital um, with strong, healthy teeth and, <laughs> and a very, very rosy, masculine, <laughs> very rosy complexion and a sort of masculine build. So, if indeed a resident of Bisley did sit on the throne of England for a, a number of years, then uh, we're not going to knock it, are we? <laughs> it's quite appropriate, Colin. Yeah, I it's think so. Very yes. appropriate, more, indeed. More than appropriate. Yes. <laughs> For centuries, towns near the village of Bisley celebrated May Day by dressing up a boy in the clothing of a female Tudor royal. The legend provides a nice piece of local color, but much of the story seems outlandish. For one thing, wouldn't King Henry have noticed a change in his daughter? Surprisingly, maybe not. Elizabeth barely saw her father. The relationship wasn't bad in the sense that they had quarrels or there was tension between them because essentially they were alienated from each other. The deadbeat dad may never have noticed the gender switch. Elizabeth was a forsaken child. She was someone you very rarely referred to. She was basically sort of a skeleton in the family cupboard. You know, someone to be forgotten, to be farmed out to some country house. In fact, there was good reason to pack Elizabeth off to the country. At the time, London was in the throes of an epidemic, the sweating sickness. Sweating sickness was particularly virulent in the 1540s and the 1550s. London was a dirty, smelly, unsavory, uh, unhygienic place. Once a victim was infected, the disease could kill within hours. The plagued city was not a safe place for the royal family. Whenever there was plague in London, the royal family tried to move out because the plague was very much associated with the urban environment. So it's quite possible that Elizabeth would be taken out of London into a country house. So the young princess may actually have stayed at Overcourt. But for most people, the idea that she died there and was replaced by a boy seems more folklore than reality. But in the late 1800s, the Bisley boy story is bolstered when the vicar of the local church makes a startling discovery. He claims he found a coffin containing a skeleton of the girl born Princess Elizabeth. It is believed that he then reburied the bones. Archaeologist Mark Horton has traveled here from Bristol to examine the coffin. Well, so this is a coffin, all right, a, a stone coffin. The big question is whether it's Roman or medieval in date. The Romans occupied Britain over a thousand years before Queen Elizabeth was born. So if the coffin is Roman, it's almost certainly not hers. One dead giveaway of a medieval coffin would be a drain hole at the bottom. Drain holes to let the putrefying flesh go out through the bottom. Um, otherwise, you tend to get gases building up, and quite often coffins could actually explode with all the bits thrown everywhere. Possibly something in there, I don't know. Ah! There it is. Oh, what's that there? Horton can now deduce the approximate date of the coffin. The fact it's got 
um, drain holes in the bottom makes certain that, it, that it's a medieval coffin rather than, say, a Roman coffin. There are lots of Roman coffins around here, this is, and they're much occupied by the Romans. So the fact is this is a medieval coffin, and I would judge it to date between the 13th and early 14th century. That would be around two or three hundred years before the young Elizabeth was said to have died at Bisley, around 1543. It's made of... Despite his skepticism, Horton says the age of the coffin doesn't completely rule out the possibility that Elizabeth was buried in it. Whoever was in there would have been reusing the coffin from two, three hundred years before. And if that's the case, then maybe the 16th century is a reasonable context because at that time it was during the English Reformation, churches were being despoiled, abbeys were being dug up and being destroyed. So the likelihood is that there are quite a lot of these coffins just lying around. If it were the case that Princess Elizabeth died here, the body would have to have been buried very quickly, and therefore the body would have been put in a possibly an existing coffin. The discovery of the coffin doesn't provide any concrete conclusions, but it certainly stokes the embers of the Bisley story. Then, in 1910, the story catches fire when the hottest author of the day gives the Bisley tale some fresh air. Author Bram Stoker gained fame when he published a classic, Dracula. Thirteen years later, in his new book, Famous Impostors, the popular and well-regarded author devotes an entire chapter to the Bisley story. According to Stoker, there were many clues. There are quite sufficient indications throughout the early life of Queen Elizabeth that there was some secret which she kept religiously guarded. What is this deep, dark secret? Stoker scrutinizes her writings and notices a drastic change in her prose, as if written by a completely different person. Elizabeth's literary style had entirely changed. The meager, grudging style had become elegant and even florid, afforded by the study of the Latin and French tongues. With his many observations, Stoker never claims the story to be true, but at the same time refuses to dismiss it out of hand. In one way, there is a duty which the reader must not shirk, if only on his own account, not to refuse to accept facts without due consideration. Wildly improbable as the Bisley story is, it is not impossible. The book ignites a firestorm of more gossip. Much of it centers on anecdotal observations of Queen Elizabeth's masculine features. Some mention her long, thin hands. The carved marble effigy of the queen on her coffin has extremely long fingers, as do paintings and pairs of gloves. She wore heavy layers of white makeup on her face, which some say could have been used to hide stubble. Though others say she could have been trying to hide scars from a bout of smallpox. She was famous for her high collars and ruffles around her neck. Believers in the Bisley Boy story see that as a convenient use of fashion to hide an Adam's apple. The athletic queen loved to hunt, and she was good in the saddle, able to outride all the women and many of the men in her court. Some portraits of Elizabeth at the time look very feminine, while others look more masculine. And finally, 
Some claim Queen Elizabeth I forbade a post-mortem upon her passing, suggesting she was hiding something. Still, with all the conjecture, most experts see the story as urban legend. And as a way to deal with a much bigger issue of that era. I think the later part of the 19th century had difficulties with confronting the problem of a powerful woman. One of the ways that they tried to deal with the problem of this powerful woman was to say that Elizabeth was an anomaly. There was something either wrong with her um, or she was in fact. The other way is that she was a man. In the royal family, a powerful and independent woman refusing to marry was a big deal. Parliament and the Privy Council spent a lot of time petitioning her, pressuring her, asking her to choose a husband and get pregnant and have an heir. If Elizabeth were to die as a single woman uh, without an heir of her body that everyone in England could accept as the next ruler, then the crown was up in the air. Despite the pressure, Queen Elizabeth doesn't succumb to becoming a desperate housewife, fueling rumors and questions of why. But perhaps her parents didn't set her the best example. You might have a dim view of marriage, too, if your father cut off your mother's head. Elizabeth I's gender counted against her from the moment she was born. It was a strike against her mother as well, Anne Boleyn. I think Henry was disappointed that Elizabeth was daughter. I think he was obviously hoping for a son. Anne Boleyn was King Henry's second wife. His first, Catherine of Aragon, had borne him a daughter, Mary. When Catherine was almost past childbearing age, a young, attractive, and flirtatious Anne became the apple of the king's eye. I beseech you now with all my heart, definitely, to let me know your whole mind as to the love between us. For necessity compels me to plague you for a reply having been for more than a year now struck by the dart of love and being uncertain either of failure or of finding a place in your heart and affection. Henry's love letters to Anne gush with a fervent desire to marry her. But the Pope refuses to grant him a divorce. Then King Henry has a great idea. He decides to leave the Catholic Church and declare himself divine leader of the Church of England. He petitions to the church courts to have his marriage with Catherine annulled. But before they act, Anne gets pregnant. When Anne Boleyn was pregnant, everyone uh, convinced themselves it was bound to be a boy, certainly Henry did. Uh, we know that from the letters that were sent out to announce the birth of a prince, and then uh, people have gone through writing a little S on the end so that it says princess. On September 7th, 1533, Elizabeth is born. King Henry is disappointed. He wants to try again, but the results are even more upsetting. The record of Anne's pregnancies while she's queen is rather curious. Princess Elizabeth is born. The following year, 1534, she thinks she's pregnant, but as we know, no child appears. What we then know is that she was pregnant at the end of 1535, early 1536, but then there is a miscarriage. There's debate as to how this disappointment affects King Henry's feelings for his wife. 
Some scholars suppose that Henry is getting rather fed up with Anne, that what he wanted at all costs was a son, and this was causing him doubts about the marriage. I'm not so sure. Your Majesty. What is certain is shortly after the miscarriage, King Henry has the Queen arrested and imprisoned in the Tower of London. The charges against her are scandalous. What Anne was accused of in May 1536 was that she had committed adultery with five men, including incest with her brother. The rumours that Anne Boleyn was having affairs it's difficult to trace exactly how they reached Henry. But when Henry learned about them, he appears to have believed them. In my view, Anne Boleyn did not have uh, affairs. I think she played flirtatiously with, with people at her court. But the court was a place where one would be extremely foolish to have affairs. All five men are found guilty. They were, they were executed, um, and uh, painfully so. There was no escape for them. There's no escape for the Queen either. King Henry wants to ground his wife, Tudor style. Princess Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, is ordered beheaded by her father. Elizabeth is not yet three years old. If you're found guilty of treason, hanging, drawing, quartering, disemboweling, your body dismembered, tarred, pickled, stuck on gates or bridges, was a warning. For you to suffer the dignity of Anne Boleyn's death, simply beheading was a great act of mercy and compassion and in the circumstances, one that most people would beg for. King Henry's final gesture of affection for his wife is to hire an executioner from France to chop off her head. A sword was cleaner and quicker than an axe, which could take two swings. Quite often, either due to nerves or, to, or drink, the executioner did bungle executions. It's common practice. That's why you get the practice of uh, the victim often paying the executioner at something. Pray for me, ladies. Anne kneels bravely and says her prayers. Jesus. The executioner picks up his sword behind her. To Jesus Christ, then just before soul. striking, Jesus he asks Christ, for his sword. So the queen doesn't know it's coming. Give me my sword. Elizabeth will soon learn a valuable lesson. Life in Tudor England can be cruel. The charges of adultery may not have been true, but if they were, they would raise a provocative question. If Anne Boleyn was sleeping round, it is possible that Princess Elizabeth, born in September 1533, might just possibly not have been Henry VIII's daughter. Who knows? It is just possible. In the end, probably unlikely. It's one of these things which is unprovable, but it's worth just leaving the possibility open. Upon the death of her mother, Elizabeth takes another blow. She is shunned and removed from the line of succession to the throne. King Henry marries his third wife, Jane Seymour, and she gives him the son he had always wanted, Prince Edward. 
And it was only um, about 1543 that Henry began to think again about the succession and realized that it was very insecure. He only had one young son, and he needed to ensure that it would continue within his line by making both Mary and Elizabeth his heirs. Now at the age of 10, Princess Elizabeth is officially reinstated and third in line to the throne. Just three years later, when she's 13, her father, King Henry VIII, dies. The young princess moves in with her stepmother, who quickly marries a close friend, Thomas Seymour. What happens next between the princess and her stepfather will be a scandal. One so salacious, it may be the reason she avoided marriage entirely. Please stop. <laughs> Elizabeth was just a 13-year-old princess when word spread of bedroom romps with her stepfather, Thomas Seymour. We have evidence from eyewitnesses of Thomas Seymour coming into his stepdaughter's bedroom in the morning and waking her up uh, before she had put on her clothes for the day. So she was in bed in her bed clothes, uh, tickling her, um, having sort of a sexualized teasing. <laughs> He slaps her buttocks and holds her in long embraces. Many in her court find the relationship inappropriate. It happened over a period of months, and Elizabeth grew uh, increasingly uncomfortable with, with these episodes. But it seems pretty clear that Elizabeth did, at times, fall under the spell of Seymour's charms. Thomas Seymour is said to be attractive, tall, athletic, and charismatic. And many believe he is using his charm to woo the impressionable teenager, possibly to satisfy his own ambitions. If Seymour married Elizabeth, he would have immediately been um, such a powerful figure in the kingdom. Any children that they had of that legal marriage would have been in the succession. And when Elizabeth became Queen of England, if she did, he would be her husband, the King of England. When Seymour's wife, Catherine Parr, dies, he conspires to marry the young princess. Some say by trying to plant his seed. Rumors he did not quell, but encouraged. His fate, though, is sealed when the 12-year-old King Edward learns of his uncle's plot to marry Elizabeth. His scheme was neither good for his soul nor his head. As for Elizabeth, Thomas's death has a lasting effect, one that would haunt her for the rest of her life. Yet, was the Seymour affair enough to put her off marriage? Many people have things happen to them in their childhood or their early adolescence that don't predetermine their whole life. So to say that this Seymour episode cemented in Elizabeth the opinion that she would never marry, I think is overreaching. But just a few years later, Elizabeth's life takes a dramatic turn when King Edward dies. Her half-sister Mary takes the throne but lasts a mere five years before she gets sick and dies too. Then, at age 25, Elizabeth, the illegitimate daughter who'd once been booted from the line of succession, rises to the country's highest post, the Queen of England. In her mind, it was destiny. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. 
Elizabeth was a very young, healthy young woman when she succeeded to the throne in 1558. She was a superb horsewoman, very powerful constitution. And an independent have been able to have children. Dr. Rita Bakken, a psychologist from Simon Fraser University, compares Queen Elizabeth's physical traits with a genetic condition which is now called Complete Androgen Insensitivity Syndrome. People with this condition are born with both male and female sex organs. It is estimated to happen in one in 20,000 babies. At birth, a baby appears to have female genitalia. However, a gynecological examination would reveal no uterus or ovaries, but instead, undescended testicles. The testes produce testosterone, but the body doesn't recognize it, so the person develops the appearance of a female. When the child is born, which will be like a normal female baby, nothing else to notice. So nobody will know whether there is any problem until the person will grow, reaches puberty. That's the time the difference will be noticed. The late Dr. Backen's paper suggests this may have happened with Elizabeth. At birth, the midwives and doctors determined her to be a female. But at puberty, Elizabeth may have noticed the condition and decided to avoid any sexual relations. If the theory is true, it would have been Elizabeth's biggest secret and possibly the reason she didn't marry. On her deathbed, reports claim that Queen Elizabeth firmly decreed that under no condition should her body be embalmed. Was Queen Elizabeth hiding something? The study makes the case that Elizabeth had many characteristics, sometimes associated with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, and that individuals typically present as attractive, intelligent, and practical. And females are above average height, slim, active, athletic, with notably long and beautiful hands. But obviously, not every woman with these traits has this condition. Backen's paper is intriguing, but most historians dispute its validity. For one thing, if the queen had this condition, what is one to make of the love affair she said to have had? Rumors have swirled for years that Queen Elizabeth I had one true love. His name was Lord Robert Dudley her horsemen. She had one great weakness, one great passion, I believe. Just one. Just one. That was Robert Dudley. Dudley was extremely attractive. He was close to her in that he was made master of the horse and so he was physically close to her, spending time with her when she was doing her favorite activities, hunting and, and riding. I'm pretty sure from the descriptions um, that Elizabeth was, as I said, in, in love with him. Her letters to Dudley hint at their closeness. You are like my little dog. When people see you, they know I am nearby. But as queen, Elizabeth had to be careful of her public image. As she learned early in life, her romantic relations were never her own. Every decision affected the entire country. And as soon as she took the throne, there was one question on everyone's mind. And immediately people say, you're young, who are you going to marry? We must have a male heir. And uh, this dominates the first ten years of Elizabeth's reign. In 16th century monarchy, 
marriage was less about love and more about political alliances. She would um, engage in marriage negotiations um, with foreign rulers. However, these negotiations are overshadowed by the presence of Robert Dudley, whom I think Elizabeth was infatuated with. It has been said that Elizabeth led with her head, not with her heart. But she did struggle with her feelings for Robert Dudley, who, according to rumors, she wanted to marry. But it was impossible. Lord Robert Dudley was already married to Amy Robsart. One of the great obstacles to Dudley's and Elizabeth's happiness was Amy Robsart. She and Dudley had married years earlier. They'd separated. Amy lived her own life while her husband, certainly when he became Elizabeth's leading courtier, master of horse, uh, fought the Queen around the country. We know from Dudley's own letters that Elizabeth was jealous of Amy Robsart. It's a 16th century love triangle. When Dudley's wife Amy falls ill, the plot thickens. There were rumours about the illness of Amy Robsart, and, and it may have been that Elizabeth and Dudley were hoping that Amy would die. Then in September 1560, Amy falls down a flight of stairs and breaks her neck. In the public's eye, the death of Dudley's wife isn't a coincidence. Rumors spread like wildfire that Dudley had his wife murdered to marry Elizabeth. Was this calculated murder by two passionate lovers? There are a number of theories. One is that Dudley killed his wife. From the evidence we have, Dudley was horrified that his wife had died. He realized this made matters worse, not better. Another rumor claims that those who wanted Dudley away from the queen had Amy killed. And yet another claims Amy Robsart committed suicide. But the biggest question on everyone's mind did Elizabeth have anything to do with it? It's possible that Elizabeth will have known what was going on if there was a plot. There is some gossip that Elizabeth was aware, but in the end, it's all so circumstantial that I would be very cautious about giving it any great weight. After an investigation, the courts rule accidental death. Still, Amy's death ends any possibility of a marriage between Elizabeth and Lord Dudley. When Amy did die, it, she died in such suspicious circumstances that Elizabeth's reputation would have been irreparably damaged had she considered a marriage to Dudley. It was brought home to her that it would be political ruin if she went ahead and, and married Dudley. Elizabeth denied they ever had a love affair. Friends, yes. But lovers, no. And no one could prove otherwise. Although there were rumors that Dudley and Elizabeth were lovers, they did not come from the household of Elizabeth. They didn't come from people who would have been in the know. I don't think Elizabeth would have taken the risk in the first place because one of the hallmarks of Elizabeth's character is that she's circumspect, she's cautious, she's politically savvy. She would not have taken the risk as far as I can see. Whatever the truth, these rumors follow Elizabeth throughout her reign and her relationship with Robert Dudley. Then, 25 years later, the rumors flare again when a ship is said to have run aground off the coast of Spain. A man announces that he is Arthur Dudley, the bastard son of the Lord Robert Dudley and Queen Elizabeth. For much of her reign, Queen Elizabeth said she was married. 
I have already joined myself in marriage to a husband, namely the Kingdom of England. It is said she adored the title, the Virgin Queen. In English. Oh. But there was one man who claimed to be the proof I am Queen Elizabeth, son. that she wasn't a virgin at all. The one story I do believe which should be investigated is the story of Arthur Dudley, a young man of 27 years of age, and claims that he was raised in Worcestershire by one Robert Southern. This Arthur Dudley says he's the son, natural son, of Robert Dudley, the Queen, that the Queen gave birth to him. Bolstering the story are records confirming there was a Robert Southern from Worcestershire at that time. Arthur Dudley was taken seriously by the Spanish and he was also taken seriously by the English agents sent out there to, to, to investigate. He was 27 years old, which means he would have been conceived around 1560. Now, if you examine this very carefully, you have Elizabeth and Dudley passionately involved with each other. We know that he had lodgings close to the Queen. Her old minister, Cecil, talks of the deep fervor between them. Darty sees the possibility the Queen could have paid off one of Dudley's servants to keep her pregnancy quiet. We have Elizabeth falling ill somewhat, and in a delirium, she says that Tamworth, Dudley's body servant, should receive 500 pounds as a gift. What did Tamworth know? That was literally millions of pounds by modern-day standards. Assuming Queen Elizabeth did get pregnant, could she really have hidden it from the people of England? Every time she moved around the countryside, it sparked rumors that she was traveling because she was really pregnant and she needed to get away from London in order to deliver all these children. If the story of Arthur Dudley is true, he is physical proof of an affair between Queen Elizabeth and Lord Dudley, and of the fact she was not a virgin. But most scholars find little credence in the story. There are a number of Tudor impostors, some of them more or less believable. But no, Arthur Dudley was not the love child of Robert and the Queen. Whether friendship or love, the relationship between the Queen and Dudley lasted many years. She never really gave up. Despite the passing of the years, despite the fact that Dudley perhaps got married at least twice, this is the man that when he died, Elizabeth locked herself in a chamber and wouldn't come out. The door had to be forced. Particularly as she aged, Elizabeth loved being called a virgin. It justified her decision never to marry. But it created a political crisis. Just who would succeed her? Increasingly, it looked as though she had uh, a way out of the religion and succession problem, which was to look to Mary, Queen of Scots' son, James VI of Scots, she never officially confirms that he will be her successor, but as her reign goes on, it becomes increasingly obvious to everyone that he's the best candidate. At age 69, after a long illness and period of decline, Queen Elizabeth I dies. In one of her requests to Parliament, she asked to be remembered as the queen without a husband. And in the end, this shall be for me sufficient, that a marble stone shall declare that a queen having reigned such a time lived and died a virgin. Elizabeth took her secrets with her when she died.
However, the debate over many of these rumors continues. We may never know the reason for Elizabeth's refusal to marry. But it's likely that one of England's most famous and revered rulers, the Virgin Queen, will remain one of its most mysterious.